All right. Can y'all see me right now? Um, anybody who's in the webinar, if you can see me, let me know in the live chat. Uh, if so, and let me know if you can hear me as well. Uh, if not, that'll be frustrating, but that's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, cool. Thank you, JC. Uh, is it JC, Jack, J JC? Am I saying it right? Okay, well, um, do apologize. Had some technical glitches. I'm using a software called Crowdcast, and on this software, uh, it's pretty good. You can do things like live stream and stream on YouTube, stream on Facebook at the same time. And I really like their live chat feature. So, um, you know, I definitely tested it earlier, but now, of course, um, none of the problems happen, you know, when you're testing. They always happen when you're live. So thank you for your patience. We're going to uh, dive in. Uh, okay, I got an update. It's Jackie. All right, cool. I thought so. I wasn't sure. Just wanted to make sure I had that right. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining. This is the webinar, How to Build a Business from Scratch, or I like to call it How to Build a Freelance Business from Scratch. Uh, we are on YouTube live um, at the moment. We are also on, and I'm double checking this right now, we're also on Facebook live as well. So I uh, just wanted to broadcast to as many people and help out as many people as I can in going through this information. Uh, if there's enough feedback, um, I'm probably going to uh, do an encore of this. I'm probably going to take the time to uh, reteach this uh, based on feedback. And some people cannot meet at this specific time. So I'm going to go over that and we'll be able to dive into it in that way as well. So yeah, uh, just a quick tour of Crowdcast for those who've joined. Uh, really, uh, it's question and answer. So as I'm talking and teaching on different topics, if you do have a question, uh, feel free to um, ask it. There's a whole section called question and answers. You can ask your question and others can vote on what question they want to hear answered. And when we get to the Q&A section, uh, we'll have a moment where we can talk about that. And uh, I'll answer all those specific questions you know, going forward. So yeah, just going from there, and I'm double checking Facebook at the moment. Let's see. All right, Facebook's up and running. That's good. YouTube is doing well. Uh, it's had on YouTube. You have different levels of strength. Earlier, that was causing problems too, but now it seems to be doing okay. So that's a good thing. All right, I think we're good to go. Let me double check one other thing. Yeah, we have about 80 slides. Uh, don't worry. Uh, I just don't have any animations in this presentation. So that means we're going to step through uh, the information. And uh, it won't be too long. I want to make sure to get through the information so I have time to answer your specific questions. So that's really uh, one of my main priorities is making sure I answer uh, everybody's question. I don't know about you, but whenever I do webinars, uh, sometimes, or whenever I'm sitting or attending a webinar, uh, the big thing for me is making sure questions are answered. And I want to make sure I have the time to answer any and every uh, question you have. I don't mind uh, taking the extra time to do that. So it's all good with me. And uh, we'll get started. Let's see. Who else we got? Okay. Also, those who are in the chat, uh, if you know anybody who could, this can benefit from, like I mentioned, it'll be about an hour, so feel free to invite them, uh, let them know what we're doing, what's going on, and what we're talking about, and uh, you know they can join in and get some value out of this as well. But like I said, the replay will be available, and I may do an encore uh, webinar to go over this information again, uh, just to a different set of people if need be. Okay, I am going to share, well, sharing my screen, I'm going to be sharing the slides. So let me know if you all can see it 
uh, when it comes when it pops up. Okay. I'm sharing it right now. Uh, do you all see it? You should see the title screen that says how to build a freelance business from scratch. Just want to make sure everybody can see that. All right, Sean confirmed it. Thanks, Sean. All right, well, we're going to dive through the information that we got. So first things first, I just wanted to take the time to uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm greatly appreciative of you joining me. But just for those who are on, there's going to be a chance to get into the list or also get into the value of a course I recently created. It's called Respect and Value. And the whole premise behind this course, honestly, is... I know when I first started freelancing and trying to build my business, uh, those are the two things that I had an issue with. I wanted clients to respect me because I did have the expertise. I did have the skill. I did have the experience, but it was hard to really try to communicate that or get people to understand everything that I knew. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was um, value. Um, I was trying to get people to understand that I had knowledge that was valuable not only that but i was trying to get people to understand that really i was trying to get people to know that i'm valuable but in a certain extent i really didn't value myself uh maybe they call it imposter syndrome whenever you know a lot of information sometimes when you're talking to a certain set of people you may feel like a fraud you may feel like you don't know anything uh, you may feel like an imposter but really uh you know more than what others do so i created a whole course to help with that, you know, it's at no charge, at no cost. You can join the course, and everybody who joins the webinar, you'll automatically be enrolled in that. And I'll show you how to get that towards the end of the talk if you're hanging with me, and we'll move forward with that. But yeah, that's available to everybody who joins the webinar today. So, really, uh, some people answered this already. I know Sean did, uh, you know, but where are you from? Where are you from? So where in the world here, me, Nathan, I am here in Houston, Texas, in the United States. But uh, where are you from? Uh, anything that I know, uh, Sean mentioned that he's from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I got a lot of friends in Atlanta, but he said he's from Atlanta, Georgia. So that's one thing. Um, got another person from Cali. Jackie said Pacifica. Cal I've never been to California. That's somewhere I actually want to be. Uh, I want to check out. Uh, I love Texas. I love Texas, but I definitely want to visit California as well. Uh, that's another thing that I've been hoping to do one day. Uh, there may be some people overseas. I saw some people registered. Not sure what time it is over there. Uh, it may be uh, later. It may be earlier in the morning as well. So they can catch the replay. But yeah, just wanted to know where everybody is from just to get a feel for it, just so I know how to specifically speak to certain things that we talk about. As I mentioned, my name is Nathan, Nathan Alote. I am a freelance web designer, and I really say freelance web designer and digital strategist, but I'll get to that in a moment. And really, I didn't go to school for web design or anything like that. I am self-taught. You know, I saw an opportunity and I saw many people were wanting websites, wanting to know how to build one, how to set one up. So instead of you know, just letting that opportunity go by, I saw an opportunity to start getting into that. So I do freelance web design. That's me. As you saw earlier, um, a lot of webinars I've been on, uh, they show a slide like this because they're not available through video. But as you saw earlier, I do have my camera set up and you can talk and interact with me uh, and see my random facial expressions when I talk about certain things. So there's that as well. Yeah, but if you want to know more about me, I have a website, NathanAlote.com. It's just my name.com. Uh, and on that website, I talk about quite a few things. I talk about how to build a successful freelance business. I also share uh, all the things that I've learned that worked. I also share all the things that I uh, learned from mistakes that I made in the past and also things that did not work out for me. But I share all those things on my website. 
and I want to make that available to you. All the content on there is free. So, you know, that's just another resource that you can go to even after this to find out uh, more information. And I wanted to make this note, if you're not aware already, um, I have a podcast. That podcast is called Freelance Jumpstart TV. And the reason it's called Freelance Jumpstart TV is it is a video. And I make videos on a weekly basis. Uh, the first season wrapped up. And I've been putting different things in place to get ready for season two. So that's coming very, very soon. Also, if you subscribe to me on YouTube, it's just youtube.com slash Nathan Alote. You can get um, all those videos and other content and some behind the scenes things I do. I know one thing that I did not put on the podcast that I put on YouTube was the whole, and I'll go back to it, the whole respect and value course. I have how I built that from scratch, you know, how I designed it, how I came up with the concept, how I wrote everything. So if you like the course and how I came up with it and the flow of it, you know, if you, you subscribe on YouTube, you can see how I built it. And I just tell you, right. I just walk you through that process. So that's available to you as well. All right. I'm, I'm excited, but uh, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of this as well. Try to minimize distractions. I know uh, you may be listening to this or passively listening to this by doing other things or working on something. Um, but if you want to get the most valuable information, you want to be attentive. You want to be here. You want to be present. You want to listen. So if that's the case, to the best of your ability, try to minimize distractions. Silence your phone. Uh, put it on airplane mode. Maybe you have a whole bunch of browser tabs open. Close them. But like I said, I don't mind if you're passively listening. Or multitasking, that's okay. But I just want to make sure you get the most valuable information and you hear it. You don't miss anything. Uh, the training will last about an hour. Uh, like I said, I'm going to try to get through the information as quick as possible so that uh, we can get to any questions that you have. Um, you can ask questions in the chat. Those who are in the live chat, they've already done that. So y'all are ahead of the curve. Um, if you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, the link, nathanlote.com slash webinar. Go there so you can join the conversation. I will see comments on Facebook and YouTube, but, um, you know, since I am in Crowdcast, which is the software I'm using for this webinar, I'm devoting my attention there. So if you want to join the conversation and make sure that you're heard, feel free to hop in there, and I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions you have or respond to anything that you have. Uh, you know, but that's where the conversation is. So go to nathanlote.com slash webinar and you can join us there. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, the video replay is available. So for those who joined on Crowdcast, you see that automatically. Or if you're subscribed, I might be sending something out. And as I mentioned, you'll be enrolled in that course as well. But the replay is available. So if you're watching this on a replay, uh, you can, of course, it's available to you and anybody else who misses missed something or didn't catch something, you can rewind and go to the specific thing you want to hear and get value out of that. OK, well, those are like the formalities, if you will. But let's jump in and let's get real. Let me get a drink. All right. Well, let's get real for a moment let's get real let's get serious let's get dangerous whatever you want to say i want to talk to you all about the next step trap and the next step trap is something that i observed that i was going through um, that i've been through and it's something that i think is a habit but you'll see what i'm talking about and you know definitely let me know in the chat uh, what you think about it and what you feel about it. And, uh, you know, I'd be happy to hear whatever comments that you have. So the next step trap is this, simply put. So, you know, most of us have been to some type of schooling before. And in school, you know, you start with elementary. Um, some people preschool. I know I went to preschool. And then I went to elementary school. So that was the next step, right? Elementary. After that, you know, for some people, they jump right into middle school, but some school systems, they have an intermediate school. So you go to elementary, intermediate school, 
Then you hop over to middle school. Uh, and then you're in middle school. And what's the next step? I don't think I even have to kind of guess. Uh, you know, you all know as well. The next step pretty much from there is high school. You know, you jump into high school and you're in high school, you're learning, you're uh, going through class, making friends, you're taking and getting ready for the SAT, the ACT, because the next step after that is college, right? So if you have, if you went through these steps and you kind of get what I'm saying in terms of the next step trap, and I'll tell you what the trap is, but um, th these are all good things. These are all good things. We should go through these in school and college is a great thing as well. But these are the steps to go through. I'm assuming everyone has been through these steps before, right? It's, no matter where you are in the world, they may call it something else. They may call it secondary school um, or anything of that nature. But everyone has been through these steps in one place or another. But going from there, I want to touch on college, right? I said you go through all those steps and you get to the next step, which is the ultimate which is college. And you look at the college, you know, you got such a beautiful layout, all these buildings. And this is where the premier learners go to learn their craft prior to joining the workforce or pri prior to doing their own thing. They go to college. And college is great. I think on TV, uh, they depict it as, you know, a fun time. Uh, you make friends for life. Not only that, but uh, you build relationships and maybe those relationships will ha help you in the future and just different bonds are formed. So, you know, I, I was looking forward to college. You know, it was it was a goal for me and I went to college and I, and I loved it. You know, that was the next step I was supposed to take. So you're in college, you're learning. And uh, most of the time you're learning. It's in a lecture style format. You're sitting down, you're hearing from someone who is uh, well learned and maybe one of the top professors in the nation or in the country, and you're hearing from them, you're learning from them, and you know, you're just studying, and you're doing this about four years, I would say. Uh, you know, uh, you're four years in and you're learning, and you're, you know, just taking everything in, you're soaking in all the information. And after you learn for about four years, uh, five years for me, because I did engineering, but after you learn for about four years, you take the next step, which is getting a job, right? But before a job, you have to take an interview. You have to go through an interview and, you know, you listen and different people interview you and ask you questions to see if you're a right fit for their company. And the thing that's kind of strange to me at this point is, you know, you proved yourself in high school and you had to prove yourself in high school so that you can apply and get accepted in college. And then once you're in college, you have to kind of prove yourself again and talk to professors and pass classes and prove your worth. And then you go through all that. And even to the interview stage, you have to prove yourself again, right? You have to prove and explain that you can be valuable to the company that you are interviewing with. So there's that stage as well. But then after that, um, and this fun, it's funny when I see these pictures, but anyway, after that, you know, you get a job, you're happy, you're working on the job, and you're just so excited as this guy is here, you know, you're wearing the suit, you're sitting in front of uh, many different computers and people are sitting next to you, and uh, you're working. So uh, this is your work life, and you love it. Uh, that's, that's how it's supposed to go, right? But I would say um, that's a little bit of a dream. That's a little bit of ideal. And most of us are kind of sleep as it pertains to that. And we need to wake up and really observe what's going on in our lives and ask ourselves some tough questions about the whole uh, next step. You know, and we need to ask ourselves is, are we really getting what we want out of our jobs, out of our careers? Are we really moving forward? towards that. And if you're in a job that you love, that's great. I'm not, I have nothing against college. Uh, I went to college. I went to grad school, nothing against college, nothing against jobs, but you have to ask yourself some tough questions. And one of them is, are you really getting everything that you want? And are you really getting everything that you're looking for um, in the job 
that you have because the whole next step trap it's ideal but things don't always go that way and i know for me uh that was not exactly the case you know for me this is not my story at all now the background is yes i went to college um you know yes i went to grad school but working right after college it wasn't an ideal job that i loved where you saw the guy smiling no that exactly was not the case and it took some time to um, get to where i'm at now and i'll, I'll kind of give a little more background to what i'm saying so again i did that like i said i went through this step everybody goes through this step you know i'm not knocking any of the steps but i did get in the habit of looking for the next thing and the issue is you're always in this habit except for when you have a job and a career you know it's expected for you to sit there and work for the next i don't know 10 20 years at that job but things are changing and they're not exactly like that i went to baylor university and you know this was my experience at baylor i liked it i loved it you know uh, private school it was good i remember sitting in front of this hall you know talking to different people um you know thinking about the future right but I want to call something out about college and it affected me and really got me towards being a freelancer and i'll show you what i mean this is an article from uh baylor's own newspaper called the bear baylor lariat and just want to call out something here on this article that they wrote a couple years ago it's about what they have for tuition right now i want to highlight this that when i went to school that's why i highlighted this article when i went to school tuition was about eighteen thousand. but now it's changed greatly this is the current tuition for baylor and the current tuition there and i'll highlight it is 56 you know thousand that's everything added together on a previous slide when you add everything together it was about 36. so it went up um by 20k right uh, it, it jumped greatly, but you would say, oh, inflation, different things. That's supposed to happen, right? And really, I don't know. But one thing that happened to me is at Baylor, because that was what I was supposed to do, and I was supposed to go through the ranks, I ended up with student loan debt. And the average student loan debt is about 37000 And I remember I, I said this fact to some other people, and they laughed because theirs were way higher than this, right? Um, but I'm bringing this up because I learned all these things at school and I still have to interview for a job and I'm obligated to pay back this large amount before I've even done anything, right? Uh, before I've even done anything or learned anything or, or secured a job, I'm still obligated to pay this back regardless, right? So all of this happened to me prior to getting a job and how did i get into freelancing specifically um, i want to give a little bit of background to uh, what i just talked about so that was school that was school that was college and i ended up with student loan debt but something else is going on in our current society things are getting more expensive on the left you have a phone i'll say it's from the 90s era uh, 99 2000 air you know it has caller id so it's pretty cool um, and then you have a more recent phone which is you know the iphone 7 on the right and i have these numbers here and i'll explain them you know back then uh you know you're going to pay somewhere close to 50 dollars a month for phone service you know smartphones didn't exist uh, way back when and if they did they weren't as advanced as they are now and the average salary was about twenty five thousand. okay fast forward to today uh, the average salary is about forty eight thousand. you know on a different jobs you may have and for phone service you know you're paying i know for me uh, my phone bill is at least a hundred dollars a month and the phone the iphone or uh, even certain Android phones or any other phone you may have, it's at least six, seven, eight hundred dollars. So what I'm calling out is things have doubled, if not tripled in cost, but what they normally pay everyone on a nine to five job has not 
you know, increased the same amount. Even with Baylor, as I brought up, uh, Baylor, and that's happening to all schools and all colleges, college is getting more expensive, but they're not necessarily proportionally increasing what they're paying people that are coming into the workforce. It's not proportionally equal, but our kids are going to go to these universities and who's going to pay for that? Us? Or are they going to go to college, end up with more debt, and then go through the next step trap, end up at a job, have all this debt, and work at a job they don't truly enjoy, but have to because they have obligations and loans to pay back? Something to think about. Now, for those who... <laughs> someone's last, Someone made a comment in the chat. I actually went to school with her. Uh, Latika's in the chat. She said, I'm, I'm with you there, you know, sick and bears. She's in the same boat. It's kind of the same thing. You know, there's this dream of going to school, but we have all these obligations. And now because we have obligations, we're working to fulfill the obligations, not necessarily what we want to do. Something just to think about uh, again. And I'll tell this story. This is a picture of where I used to work. Uh, when I came out of college, I worked for a web hosting company, and uh, I would sit in an area similar to this. Uh, they had different floors, different people were assigned to do different things, and I learned a lot at this company. A lot of people were smart. I uh, learned tons of information here, but this is where I worked, and I remember working, and I was working so hard, and it was time for, I want to uh, talk to you guys face-to-face, -face, so I'll switch it. And it was time for me to uh, have my annual review. And I was excited because I had worked so hard be over this past year. Not only that, but I was nominated for Employee of the Month. Not only that, but when I was nominated for Employee of the Month, uh, my supervisor uh, had to take a leave of absence. And he said, Nathan, can you take over the reins? I said, well, I guess so. And under my reins, my department set historical records for the company in terms of efficiency, productivity, um, overall work morale, uh, which is why I got nominated for Employee of the Month. So uh, under everything I did, you know, the department was in the best shape it's ever been in. I don't think that was a coincidence. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying because I was an employee, I knew how to relate to the other employees. So I just did everything that I've heard people talk about. And it was time for my review. And I was like, oh, it's my review now. You know, I know it's going to go well because, you know, record setting pace at the company. So I sit down and, uh, it, you know, they give me compliments. You know, they say nothing but compliments. And then they say, you know, Nathan, I know you've been working hard and um, I know you've been producing. But, you know, just with some things going on at the company, uh, we can only give you a raise of about like 50 cents per hour. Okay. Uh, you know, I had some back and forth, some conversation about it, but that was it. You know, that's all they could give me at the time. And that led, led me to this quote, uh, tweet it if you want to, but it says, you are valuable. And I'll switch screens back. It says, you are valuable. If you don't give yourself a raise, no one else will. So when this happened and the company told me that they could only give me so much of a raise, it frustrated me. Um, not only that, but I didn't like how I put in the genuine work and set records at the company and everybody saw that I brought value, but I didn't have control over getting paid what my worth was. It was the company, or it was the economy. I didn't have control over what I made. And that frustrated me. So I started thinking about what do I need to do? I see some people in the chat. Sean said, been there. Jackie says, always believe that. You know, so you have to be able to give yourself a raise. And one of the reasons I wanted to put this on is freelancing is a way to give yourself a raise. And at this point, when I worked at the company, I started looking for ways to, uh, what can I do on the side to get more income? I still got these student loans. They're not really giving me a raise. Working hard is not going to get me where I want to be. Sure, I can leave the company and find another job, but it's like I'm pressing the reset button. 
you know, I'm going to find a new job. I got to prove myself again. And maybe after their review, maybe I'll get something. Maybe. I don't know. So uh, I was just frustrated and I started looking for ways to freelance. But this is a great quote from uh, Chris Gilbo. And he wrote, I believe he wrote The $100 Startup, uh, many other books as well. And uh, he has a great blog. You just go to his name.com. That's his blog pretty much. He travels as well. He teaches you how to travel. And what it's starting to come to with the student loan debt and the, I guess I'll say, (laughs) minute, mediocre raises at times, what it's really starting to come down to is a side hustle isn't just nice. It's necessary. Like if you want to, if I really wanted to eclipse my student loans, I had to get a side hustle. It wasn't a choice. I just was looking for what could I do? How could I go about finding it? And how could I go about trying to build a business, right? I'll take a drink of water real quick. But how could I find that thing? And how could I find that side hustle that would Give me that extra income I needed to get over the hump since my job wasn't really giving me a raise. What could I do? It's it's absolutely necessary. So freelancing became a viable option for me. And I saw, and this is how I came about freelancing. So I was learning some things on the job and I I told them of all my ideas. I said, I think we should do this. You know, I've been talking to people. I've been talking to our clients. They want this thing. Nobody was really listening to me. Nobody nobody uh, wanted to implement any of the ideas I had. I even gave presentations about it. I even did research about it. They weren't taking it. So, so here's the thing. All the good ideas you may have that you might be trying to convince someone else to invest in or, or follow you, use your ideas and start building something. Start building something of your own. And I have this slide up because freelancing also was on the rise. And currently, right now, uh, freelancers make up about 35% of the U.S. workforce. This is from a survey done by Freelancers Union. You go to freelancersunion.org. You can see this from uh, 2016. So freelancing is getting more popular. More people are seeing it as a viable option. Technology has made it easier. All you need is a laptop, Wi-Fi, and you can start getting into freelancing. So back then I realized that this was an option. So I started getting into it uh, more and more. And the question, and now we're really diving into the main teaching I wanted to get into. I just wanted to give background of, you know, where we're at and, you know, see if you all relate to me and it seems that you do. But, you know, now we're getting into the main thing. And the question is, how do you discover what area to start building a business? So how do you know what area to freelance in? And to demonstrate this, I'll give an example. Uh, This is Helena, Helena Price. And Helena Price, she actually lives in California. So Jackie, uh, she lives in Cali. And she is one of the most sought after photographers in the tech industry. Um, Really, uh, she's kind of a big deal. Um, You know, I I, I like Helena because she is very humble and uh, she knows that she's fortunate, but uh, she's worked with some very big clients. Um, On the left-hand corner, you got former President Bush and his wife. And she took that picture, I believe it was for Vogue magazine, uh, you know, on the middle, she has, you know, fitness. I believe it was some things she took for uh, Fitbit. Uh, and then to the right, you have the Nike Fuel Band. Uh, she has some other things that she's done. Uh, the, the guy with the basketball is Harrison Barnes. He used to play for the Golden State Warriors. Now he plays for the Dallas Mavericks. But uh, it was also some things with Fitbit that he did. And to the right, um, she has a new um, technology with uh, a medical company and she took photos for that. So she's taking these premier photos of celebrities, of uh, major tech companies. Uh, Like I mentioned, she, one of her clients was Nike and really impressive work, really impressive work. And she's finally doing what she really wants to do. And how did I know all this stuff? Um, I sat down and I interviewed her. 
you know, I reached out to her and just said, hey, do you mind if I sit down and talk to you about a few things and we can, you know, I can just share and ask some questions and um, you, it'll be more helpful for you to answer these questions. And I share them with others uh, instead of, you know, people just trying to guess, um, wow, you know, how did she get all these people? So she was, you know, real friendly, sat down and told me all of these things. And I want to recommunicate to you how she made the jump. So again, going back to the question, how you discover what area to start building a business is what question do people ask you the most? So in reference to Helena, she was working at a company doing uh, customer success and customer support. And, you know, she didn't mind doing it, but uh, she had a hobby and that hobby was taking photos. And she always had that hobby ever since she was young. But she noticed when she was working um, with the company she was at, it was a tech company. She noticed a lot of these tech companies in California, like they they didn't have good photos. And if they did, they were all stock photos and everybody had stock photos of one another. So it just, and they had the same photos on the same site. It just didn't capture and tell a story. And she was thinking, you know, wow, you know, um, there's a real need here. But it wasn't until she spoke with one of her friends who uh, said, hey, I have a tech company. I have a big company. They're looking for a client. Can, can you shoot it? And the friend was aware of this because they were aware of Helena's hobby. Now, she was nervous because it was a big client, but she's like, yeah, sure. It went well. And, you know, one after the other started seeing her work and it went on from there. But really, Helena was able to take advantage of a pain she saw in the tech industry because it wasn't a direct question people asked, but something that she kept hearing was, where can I go to find a photographer who specializes in tech photos? They didn't know the answer. And she became the answer. So one way you can discover what area of freelancing to start building your business is think about what people ask you the most. What question do people ask you about? So I know Sean is in the chat right now. So Sean, if people ask you a lot about SolidWorks or they ask you a lot about what you do, um, you can even take it deeper. You could even say, at my company right now, I use computer-aided design software. What questions do I hear people in my position always asking? What questions do I hear or what problems do I see people always have. Find out those common problems. You can even ask and interview um, other people who use computer-aided design and just say, what trips you up the most? Uh, what do you have difficulty in? Or what do you wish you had? And they'll start giving you answers. And when you, you add up all these answers, you'll start to see similarities. And these similarities are a hint at what you can probably offer to them since you're in a similar boat. For me, it was something similar. It was, uh, I, work, I was working at the web hosting company and people kept, uh, people being our clients, uh, we were in charge of the server itself. We were in charge of managing the server, getting the server up and running. And we didn't make websites for people. But people kept asking, I need help with a website. I don't know how to work on WordPress. I don't know how to work on Drupal. I don't know how to put this together. Um, how how do I build a business? How do, They kept asking all these questions about websites, and all I could really say is, hey, I can get you started, but I can't help you because our company doesn't provide that. We just do server administration, right? That's all, they, that's all that I could say. So I saw an opportunity that I could offer web design because here's a whole pool of people I talk to on a daily basis I'm at my day job who want a website but don't know where to go or how to get started. It was a clue. And that's the next point, you know, uh, on your day job, do you notice, and I'll switch back, but on your day job, do you notice, you know, similar opportunities that companies are just not taking advantage of? And as I mentioned, I told people at my company about these opportunities, but they didn't take advantage of it, you know? So, okay. What companies are similar to the company I work at that have problems? And here, here's a hint. Here's another, this is a bonus here. I also did this. 
Um, I literally would call other companies and say something like this. Hey, my name is Nathan, Nathan Alote. Um, you know, I'm trying to uh, build a business, but I want to make sure I help and serve my customers in the best way. Um, is there anyone I can speak to in your organization that would be willing to sit down and answer questions for about a 10 minute call and answer a few questions for me? I'll send questions ahead of time. You know, are they willing to sit down and talk with me? Um, see, the problem with this is most people think you have to interview the CEO. So let's say Facebook. So they're like, oh, man, how can I talk to Mark Zuckerberg? You don't need to talk to Mark Zuckerberg. You need to talk to the number 10 person. You need to talk to the person that's on the floor. You need to talk to the person that works there on a regular basis and say, hey, you know, um, I know Facebook exists. I'm thinking of starting a business that caters to social media. Can I sit down with you and ask you questions? You can find these people on LinkedIn. You can find them on LinkedIn. You can find them on Facebook. They put down where they work. So in your industry, you can find people who you can ask questions to to see what their common struggles are, what the common problems are. Like, it's not too hard to do this. Everyone that I reached out to and called, no one rejected me. Nobody. Now, here's a clue. Um, you have to call people who are not your direct competitor and maybe don't live too close to you, right? Um, you, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to call someone that's too close to you. Uh, you know, you because they may think that you're a competition and they may feel threatened, perhaps. So, um, again, you know, shout out to Jackie. Um, when I was getting into freelancing and thinking about websites, I called web design companies who live in California. I called them and said, can I sit down with you 10, 15 minutes? And they answered a whole bunch of questions for me. And I started seeing commonalities of what I could maybe offer or maybe even learn to help. See, that's the thing. If you don't know it, that's okay. If you see a common problem and you're like, well, I don't know if I can build a business. I don't know. It's like you can learn how to help that person. So just because you don't know it, that's okay. Uh, there may be opportunity for you to learn. And not only that, but the last thing I'll say, like in Helena's case, what hobbies do you have? Like, honestly, what do you enjoy doing um i don't i didn't have her on a slide here but um i know somebody they are a youtuber and their youtube started by talking about hair care talking about hair care tips and random stuff like that i mean i don't have a lot of hair so that won't work for me but they were talking about hair care tips and things like that and it went from a hobby to a source of income because a whole bunch of people wanted to know what those tips were and they built a YouTube following, and I think, I think they're almost at, uh, I think they're almost at 100k now, something like that. But yeah, so really, there are hobbies you can make a business. I like playing basketball; it's a hobby. But there's people who make a living off of playing basketball, right? You may like in your free time drawing different things and sketching. There are people who make money sketching, right? Uh, so. Again, there may be some hobbies that you have that you can turn into a business. And that's what Helena did. Photos was a hobby. She saw an opportunity. She compared her opportunity with her hobby. She had a business and she's doing photos full time. So y'all still trekking with me? Um, I'm going to check the chat really quick. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Sean's writing it down. Uh, he's doing different research. Okay. Okay, checking that out. We're, we're going to dive into, you know, four questions for every freelancer. So if you're a current freelancer, think about these questions. If you're thinking about getting into freelancing, these are four questions that you absolutely positively have to answer. All right, so let's dive in. First question, what business problem are you solving? And I've said this on my podcast. Um, I've said this in different things. Um, I've said this on my blog. I say this to everybody I talk to. Even in my day job, I ask this question on and on and on and on. Some people get it. Some people don't. But this is the most important question of business. What business problem are you solving? Uh, a lot of people look at um, different businesses and they say, oh, they're lucky. They they rode the wave of the dot-com bu bubble. They rode the wave 
and they look at different things like that. Business is all about solving problems. And the better you're able to define what problem you're solving, then you can start crafting how you're unique and how you really help people. Here's the thing. I do web design. And the problem is not I make websites. The problem is not someone did not have a website. That's not the problem. Uh, because if it, if I if I define that as a problem, it starts to trivialize what I do. Oh, you need a website? I make those. Well, a lot of people make websites. They even have tons of website builders that are out there and companies are starting to move towards click and drag interfaces so people can make their own websites. So if I define the problem as uh, you need a website, I make websites. I'm replaceable. I'm interchangeable to other people. If I define it that way, I would like to define it as such. I am not just a web designer. I do web design and I use that to execute my digital marketing strategy for my clients. So here's the thing. The problem I'm really solving is people want to start a business. In the past, if you wanted to start a business, you needed startup capital or you needed a business loan so that you can open up a brick and mortar store. And then once you have a brick and mortar store, then you can start hosting clients. Then you can start bringing them in. And, and, you're, and you're similar to uh, the next step trap. You're operating when you have debt hanging over your head. Similar to when I went to college and I was working a job. I had debt hanging over my head, so I had to keep working. Even if I didn't fully enjoy it, I had to keep working. I had an obligation. But if you get a brick-and-mortar store, it's the same way. You are you need clients. You need customers because you have this you know, loan that you need to pay back that you took out for business. So with web design, I can give you a virtual home to where you can set your business up and not have exorbitant fees or exorbitant loans you took from the bank. So I get you up and running with a website for under under $10,000 and this loan over here, it would have been 50K or so. You can build an online business and run your online business from the comfort of your home. I can help you do that. You can build an online business to where you're getting income passively and it's helping you supplement your day job. I can help you do that. That's a different problem being solved than saying, I make websites. So really quick, um, for those who are in the chat, um, what business what business problems are you solving or what business problems do you think you would like to solve moving forward? And uh, I'll come back and read your responses, but go ahead and write it down in the chat and let me know because uh, I don't mind helping you define what problem you're solving. And the better you define the problem, the better you can start positioning yourself to be valuable for your services. So, yeah, going from there, I have this example. Uh, I talked to Samuel Hulick. I also interviewed him like I interviewed Helena. I love how he defines what products are and what problem solving is. He, he always talks about it in terms of benefits versus features, right? A lot of people talk about features like um, you should work with me. I know a lot. I have 10 years of experience. I've been doing this a long time. That's a feature. Nobody cares about how long you've been doing this. People care about can you get it done? So it works the opposite way. Just because you've done it 10 years, that doesn't mean you can do it in a way where people care, right? And not only that, but it works the opposite way. If you've just started and you're new, but you do great work and you can solve a problem, nobody cares that you've only been doing it two years or one year or zero years. If you can do the work, they'll, 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 they'll onboard with you. But in this example, Samuel laid out, he says, you know, this is from Super Mario Brothers. If you haven't played or heard of Super Mario Brothers, I don't know what to say. But um, you can play it online for free if you haven't. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, that game came out in the 80s. So hopefully everybody's familiar with it. It revolutionized gaming and everyone loves it. So over here you have a small Mario, right? 
And it says, this is a person who's a customer and this is your product or service that you're selling. And this is saying, I make websites. That's not what you're selling. This is what you need to sell. You need to sell how awesome this person is once they work with your services. This is how awesome they are, right? This works with anything. Um, as a web designer, I don't need to focus on my expertise and what I can offer. I need to focus on, okay, what type of website do you want to build? Okay, you want to build an e-commerce store. Okay, um, I want to get to the point to where you can not only manage your own e-commerce store, but get you to the point of getting passive revenue on a monthly basis. So not only am I going to help build you a website, I'm going to give you a marketing plan for you to use so that one day in the future, you can manage your own site and you're in full control of the products you're selling and you're in full control of managing the site. And I'm still available for any questions that you may have. So I may talk to somebody and say, you're opening an e-commerce store. Is it closed? I want to help you become bigger than Ugg Monk. And if you don't know Ugg Monk, um, it's a clothing store um, that has blown up and they sell different products as well. But uh, again, that's what I need to tell somebody. I can help them become that. I don't need to talk about what I can do. Make it about the person. And this works in anything, uh, anything. I know some people, they're probably going to watch this on a replay. Uh, they're makeup artists, right? They're professional makeup artists that work in the movie industry. So again, makeup artist, it's not about, I have a lot of years of experience. Um, I know all the different types of chemicals. I use natural, uh, people don't know about that. They just want to know how awesome can you make me look? Well, I can make you look magazine cover worthy. That translates more than I've been doing makeup for 20 years. That doesn't, I, I don't get it. You know, um, thank you, Jackie. She put up what she does. Uh, let me speak to that. You help businesses define their needs and recommend design solutions. Okay. So, okay. So basically, you're a translator. You know, you're a success translator. People tell me exactly what they need, and I take their needs and give them answers to all their problems. So basically, I would say, Jackie, you're saving people time. Time is just as valuable as money. So we'll talk about this later. There's a way for you to put value on that time. We'll talk about that. Second question. Um, the first question was just business problems. I know that was a lot, right? But it was important. Second question is, has someone paid you for the work? And again, we're going through the four uh, questions for every freelancer. Um, you need to ask yourself this question. Uh, a lot of people get caught up in the details. They say things like, Oh, well, uh, I need to write a business plan. I need to go through the... No, that's not the first thing you need to know. The first thing is, have you gotten someone to pay you? I remember when I was learning web design and going through web design and trying to figure it out, I finally got to the point to where I was confident in um, web design. But it wasn't until someone said, Nathan, I know you uh, are getting into web design and you know I have a project for you. I'll pay you. Now I'm officially a professional. When someone pays you, you're a professional at that point going forward. So if you have an idea, that's great, but you have to get somebody to pay you for it. You have to get someone to, or really you have to convince them that you're valuable enough to spend money on, right? And I love how Nathan Barry puts this. Uh, Nathan Barry, uh, he was a freelancer for some time and now he's into uh, products and he has an email service called ConvertKit, but he was a freelancer for a long while. And he says, your business will be built on successful payment, not positive opinions. So, so if you want to know what people really think, ask them to pay for it. So again, you can work on your business all you want, but until you get somebody to pay you, that's the key. And once you get somebody to pay you, you can start asking them, what was it about me that made you want to work with me and my services? And they can tell you, right? And you can use that to get better. So that's the second question. You have to get someone 
to pay you. So no matter what ideas you have, you have to get someone to pay you money. Going from there, do you enjoy the work? Do you enjoy the work? Um, there are plenty of things that you can do. Um, an example for me is uh, lawn care, right? Um, if I wanted to get in the lawn care, I could. I know how to cut grass. I know how to use a lawnmower. I know how to use an edger. I know how to use a hedge clipper. But would I enjoy doing that? No. So many people are talking about getting into freelancing and doing certain things. But certain people don't enjoy that. And if you don't enjoy it, you'll just end up burning out with what you do. So ask yourself honestly and truly, do you enjoy the work of what you're trying to build? Because if you truly enjoy it, that passion will get you through those times where you may be tired. But if you enjoy it, you'll be able to press through. Last question. Do you want to be a freelancer or an entrepreneur? And I'll switch back. Do you want to be a freelancer or an entrepreneur? Huge question. Huge question. And there's a difference. There's a difference between a freelancer and entrepreneur. A lot of people act like they're the same thing. They're not. Uh, I And I did a whole episode on this on my podcast, freelancejumpstart.tv. And you can go to two. That's the second episode. On the left is Seth Godin. On the right is Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs. And the question is, are you a freelancer or an entrepreneur? The main difference is a freelancer gets paid when they work. So in other words, you're building a business and you don't mind being the main driving force behind the source of revenue. And you don't mind wearing multiple hats. And you don't mind that because you enjoy it. You like working with clients, talking to people. You're a freelancer. Seth Godin is a public speaker, an author. If he doesn't write a book, nothing happens. If he doesn't he doesn't speak at an event, nothing happens. He's a freelancer. He has to have a direct impact on his income. Steve Jobs is more of an entrepreneur. He built a company that still exists without him. So whether or not he worked or not, he is still, Apple is still going forward, still moving forward, and he was the co-founder. So this question is important because it will determine your decision-making. Are you trying to build something to where you're the main person going to do the work, or are you trying to build something that's larger than you and you can start passing off different tasks? So again, those are the four questions. You know, what business problem are you solving? You have to know what business problem are you solving? Uh, moving on from there, and I'll go back just so you can see. You have to know somebody has paid you for the work. Again, do you enjoy the work, and are you a freelancer or an entrepreneur? Those are four questions every freelancer has to ask themselves. Now we're going to dive into 10 mistakes freelancers make and how to avoid those mistakes. Now, in this, I'm going to give a lot of, now I don't, I don't know if there's any comments. I'm looking at the chat right now, but I'm going to give a lot of information about each one of these mistakes. So we can talk, we'll talk about pricing and a lot of other things as well. I'm just reading Sean's comment. He he's talking about that uh, he assists engineers in taking their initial concept, creating a 3D parametric model utilizing CAD software and produce a manufacturable product. Now, I went to school for engineering, so I know exactly what Sean is talking about. And I've built things and given them to, I built things in design software, given them to a machinist, machinist builds it, and then I have my part. Uh, for Sean, I would say it's very important that you decide who your target market is. Um, do you, because using language like that, suggests that you're working with engineers. But if you wanted to work with someone um, who is an everyday consumer or someone who is a business founder, you could say the same thing, but you would uh, change it. You would you would say something to the effect of, again, um, I can make a 3D model of your product because you need a 3D model of your product to make a prototype. And then we can iterate 
on making the design of your product better. That's translating if you're working with someone who wasn't an engineer. Uh, but again, uh, just all of this is framed around how you're communicating what you have to offer. But we're going to get into these 10 mistakes and how to avoid that. So first mistake, <laughs> this is counterintuitive, I know. Uh, first mistake is you call yourself a freelancer. Sean, I think Sha Sean knows this. I, Sean knows this. Uh, he's seen me teach about this in different times. But it, I know this is kind of uh, meta, right? It's I'm talking about how to be a freelancer, and I'm saying don't call yourself a freelancer. But it's important. Uh, I'll tell you what I mean. This is important because, again, and, I, and I'll look at, look at the camera because I want to talk to you, the viewer. This is important because you don't want to call yourself a freelancer and subject yourself to everybody's idea of what they think a freelancer is. You want to do a better job of describing what it is you do. Like I said, I said I'm a freelance web designer so that you guys can quickly understand what I do. But I don't ever call myself that to clients because they'll just say, oh, Nathan, he's a web guy. He knows about he knows about the Internet. That's not what I want to communicate. I have to say something to the effect of. I am a digital marketing strategist. I may or may not use a website to solve your problem. But more than likely, a website will be a part of the solution. There are some people who say, I need a website, I need a website. They might just need a mailing list. That's it. Uh, there's some people who say, I need a website, I need a website. They might not. They might just need a one-page splash or landing page, and that's all they need. They don't need anything else. I know uh, businesses who don't really have a website. They specifically operate on Facebook and their Google listing. That's it. They don't even have a website, and they're doing well. So I can't call myself, I'm a web designer. Because then someone may think, oh, he just does websites. No, I do more than that. It depends on what your business problem is, right? And a website may help with that. So again, don't call yourself a freelance anything. Uh, that's for us here who are talking now. You know, that's kind of, I guess, internal conversation. To clients, don't call yourself that. You are a digital marketing strategist. You are a consultant. Um, you are um, you are a CAD design. You know you are, you use computer aided design. You specialize in SolidWorks. Um, you are you know don't call yourself. It depends on what you are. Uh, Jackie said a business analyst. I'd probably change the word business to something more direct in the field you want to work in. So if it's just because business is very broad, uh, maybe if you worked with tech companies, you would say. Um, something to the effect of, uh, I'm a tech startup solutions analyst. Okay. Or you can even, you can even get a little more specific. Maybe you work with certain tech companies, right? Uh, then you would call yourself that type of tech company that you're a solutions analyst for that or a solutions consultant, whatever you want to say, but don't call yourself a freelancer. Um, I made that mistake and people put me in a box and I was not happy with the box they put me in. Here's something that's big. You're not charging enough. There may be some people on here saying, I don't even know what to charge in the first place, right? Um, but this is a mistake a lot of people make. You're They're not charging enough. And the problem with this is if you give people the opportunity to pay you less, they will. If you give people the opportunity to pay you less, they will. And you don't want to subject yourself to getting paid less than what you're truly worth. Um, I know I've done that in the past and it has come back to bite me. Uh, I'm not happy about it, but I, I definitely learned that it's not something that I wanted to do um, by charging not enough for the value that I really was bringing to the table. And that's happened far too often with me in the past. Just on that point, um, has there been anyone who uh, maybe doesn't know what to charge or 
is trying to figure out what to charge or maybe feels like they're not charging enough. I just want to hear if there's any comments on that and I'll come back to the chat and speak to that uh, whenever I see some answers posted. But that's another, that's a big mistake I see. And like I said, I fell victim to that myself. So I'm not above, you know, falling victim to that uh, as well. Again, uh, I'll answer this question really quick and I'll come back to it. I'll answer it really quick and then I will, let me actually copy it, Jackie. She asked a question. I'll answer this more in detail later, but I'll speak speak to it a little bit right now. And all she said was, you know, what is a social media plan worth for a small business? Uh, great question. I'll get to it later, but the answer would be, it depends on how much potential revenue they can make, right? So, a social media plan just ask if you brought in i'll speak I'll, i i like math so i'll use math really quick and i'll let me switch the screen since i'm talking i'll use math really quick so a company makes a certain amount of money every month their website maybe brings in a certain amount of uh website visitors every month okay if you had a social media plan maybe the social media plan would help raise awareness or bring more people to the website more than likely um, if you took how much money the company made in six months or in a year and divided that by their um, website traffic you can say each visitor is worth a certain amount so again uh, if you can do a social media campaign that brings more visitors to the website you know how much each visitor costs. And it's a bonus if those people pay, right? So if you can find paying customers through targeted marketing on social media, it's it's literally worth however much sales you can generate. So you can start charging something that's closer to the amount of sales you bring in. Again, the problem is not getting likes on Facebook. That's not the problem you're solving for. Oh, look at us. We got a thousand likes. Um, going back to Nathan Berry's post, you can't make money off people's positive opinions. Oh, a thousand people like this. It doesn't matter. How many of those people will purchase something? And if you can figure out or raise the rate in which people purchase, then you can say, hey, I brought you a campaign. This many extra people came to your website. A visitor's valued at $10 per visitor. I brought... 10,000 people, you can start doing some math to figure out what you need to charge. I'll come back to that though in a Q and a, but yeah, going forward from there, that's just a quick answer. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just looking at a new comment here. Sound designer. <laughs> These are good questions. I'll come back to this. Um, I'll just read it really quick. Uh, Langa said, I'm a sound designer and I usually ask the client what their budget is for sound. I feel like this is always wrong and I'm not charging enough. Uh, a quick clue, we'll come back to this. Asking the client what their budget is, they have no idea what the budget is because they don't know what the value is. So how do they know what the budget is? You know, um, you have to tell them what it is. Uh, I hate to use this analogy, but I will. When you walk into a car, they use sales techniques. When you go into a car lot, you're going to buy a car. It's very rare they say, what's your budget? Because they don't care what your budget is. They say, what do you want? What are you looking for? They hear what you're looking for and they say, here's a recommendation. And you say, I can afford that or I cannot. And then they say, okay, here's another recommendation. Here's another recommendation. So really, you need to listen to what the needs are for the person and their sound. And then tell them you want to go with this and you, you need to start presenting them with different options. I'll get into that in a different slide, though. I wanted to talk about not charging enough. Uh, I'll take a drink really quick. I wanted to talk about not charging enough. And in my pricing journey, 
I was I always felt like I wasn't charging enough, but I didn't want to charge too much. So I was here and I was always getting people who were looking for a deal or a discount or they wanted a hookup or something. I was always getting these people with all my expertise, with all my college, with 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 all my grad school, with everything that I learned at the uh, web hosting company technology job and everything that I learned. When I first started freelancing, I was getting nothing but hook up clients and it was bothering me. It was frustrating me, but that's because I was not charging enough. Uh, I'll sum this up quickly. There is a realm of people that live over here that because you're charging a low price, they will never use you. They will never use you or your services because they're up here. I'll give an example. Uh, I don't know if he's watching, but I have a friend went to college with him. He has taken photos for celebrities right and he has major skills and he's been increasing his skills since college so he's been doing it uh man it's it's over 10 years now so he's been doing it for a while here's the thing if he's if he says uh let's just say a celebrity goes to him i'll say michael jordan the the greatest of all time basketball michael jordan says i'm looking for a photographer and i said oh my you know hey uh michael you need to use my friend he's amazing um, he charges, he only charges about $300 per photo session. He's great though. Michael Jordan is not going to pay for him because by him charging so low, it will make him nervous that he can't get the job done. And for those who do excellence is, is not going to be low. It's not going to be low at all. Here's another example. Um, right here on the desk, I have, um, and I'll, I'll switch cameras because I'm showing I'm showing uh, my laptop that I have right here. Right here is a laptop, right? Um, this is a MacBook Pro, right? Okay, got a MacBook Pro, great. Um, MacBook Pros are valued at, and they actually have a new version of the MacBook Pro. So I have the, well, it's the old model now. It was the new model. Now it's old model, but whatever. Um, and I'm actually going to go to Apple's website. And I'm going to see how much does this MacBook Pro cost? Uh, a MacBook Pro. Apple is telling me how much it costs, right? They're not asking me what my budget is. They're telling me how much it costs. And when I click on buy, and I'll go the low... The low one is uh, I'll go for I'll try to get something similar to this. I'll try to find something that's a similar model to the one that I have. Uh, let's see. Okay, this one. It's about three thousand, almost three thousand. Well, plus tax, three thousand dollars. Three thousand dollars for this laptop. Now, and Apple told me how much it's worth. If I come to you and I tell you, um, hey, Sean. Hey, Jackie, hey, Amelia, you know, um, hey, Latika, whoever. Um, if I come to you and I say, I'm going to sell you this laptop for $100. It's all yours. You start getting hesitations. You start thinking, is it good enough? Um, why is he selling it for $100? Is it broken? Is it refurbished? Um, did, he, did he mess it up somehow? Like, I, I don't, you start not trusting you know, um, the laptop, because you, because in your mind, you're like, there's no way it could be a hundred dollars and be worth or be good. Right. And going back to the slide, because of my low pricing, that's what I was doing because I priced low. People were nervous about whether or not I could do the job. So again, I mentioned earlier, reaching out to other companies, you can call other companies and ask them, how did you come up with this price? You can call other freelancers who are doing what you want to do and ask them, how did you come up with this price? Now, like I said, some people may think you're trying to uncover their business, but if you're asking the right questions to people who are not really your competition, they don't mind telling you. How did you? Matter of fact, I just put up Apple's website. Um, every every company that's publicly traded on the stock market has something called a 10K. 10k you can search apple 10k and read the documentation on why they came up with their pricing and 
why they feel like it's valuable and how they're making what they're making. They just tell you. So that's another way to kind of find out how to come up with pricing. Reach out to other businesses and ask them or ask me. We'll talk later about this a little more. Um, Sean has a good comment. He's just following up. He's saying uh, you start questioning the quality of a product due to low pricing. And the same thing happens when you have a service. Um, people do the same thing. You know, I love eating pizza. Pizza is great. But, you know, I don't know about pizza for uh, 10 cent slices of pizza. I don't know about that. I don't know if it's real cheese. I don't know if it's real pepperoni. I don't know about that. I probably wouldn't want to check that out. The third thing, uh, freelancers, the mistake they make, they're not diversifying their income. And I'm going to go faster because this is only number three. I'm going to go faster so we can get through. Um, you're not diversifying your income. And uh, people tend to make this mistake as well. They don't uh, take the time to diversify the income that they could get. And I'll tell you what I mean. When you're getting income, you need to take the time to find out different ways to make that specific income. Let's go back one slide. I went forward. I'm going to go back. Let's go back one slide. What people tend to do is say, man, maybe I'm not charging enough. I'm down here. I want to be up here. That's what I want. I want those people. I want the luxury people. That takes time to get here. It's not overnight you can get here. I will admit, uh, Lauren Hooker, she has the website called Ellen Company Design. Um, she did a good job of raising her rates like four to six times in a year. So she went from like a thousand to like 7,000 plus just raising her prices with every new client. Uh, and she talks about it on her blog and I'll send the link after this is over, but she talks about that. She raised her prices so you can translate fairly quickly, but it was over the course of a year. Another thing to do to diversify your income is make a product or make a service for every level of people that you see listed here. Give me a hookup are people that are paying a little low, the people who want a discount, opportunistic, luxury, make a product or a service for each person. Maybe you have a lot of people who want a hookup, right? Okay. On your website, start blogging about topics that are relevant to your business and make that free. So if you want a hookup, go read my blog. Now you don't feel guilty about saying no or passing people off. Now you say, you need a, okay, hey, Nathan, I need help. I don't have a lot of money. Um, okay, cool. I wrote some free stuff. You might want to go read it. <laughs> okay. Um, at the same point, you know, those who want a deal or a discount, maybe, um, you, maybe you're able to communicate to someone, I have a service. This is how long it takes me. If I was charging you hourly, this is how much it would cost, but I've bundled it together at this flat rate price. Now it looks like a deal because even though the service you're offering is 40 hours or 30 hours or whatever it is, if they did the math, they know, man, 30 times their hourly rate, it would have been this, but they're only doing this flat rate. I got to take it. Again, that's another thing. Opportunistic are people who can be persuaded either way. And luxury and premium are over there. They just want the problem solved and they want it solved a good way. So diversifying your income, you can make a product or service for each of these types of people. Uh, a, a good thing that I like to do is say, write a book or an ebook. It's really not that hard to do. Uh, I can explain that a little more later. You can write an ebook on what the answer is, telling someone what to do. Going from there, um, you can schedule a consulting call and charge somebody um, $60 to $100 for an hour of consulting, you know, just talking to them and saying, let's jump on a call. I'll tell you what to do. Going from there, um, you have actually doing the work for them, right? So again, now you have different options. People can come to you and buy an ebook you wrote. People can come to you and get consulting. 
or people can come to you and get the actual work done. Now you're starting to diversify your income and it's not one thing only you're selling. And now there's different options you tend to have. Going from there, uh, number four, because I want to get to the questions you all have. Uh, the mistake some freelancers make is you do whatever the client says. This comes from the customer is always right. You hear that a lot. The customer is always right. The customer is always right. No, they're not. The true mark of a professional is they listen to the client and then they translate what the client needs and the client can go and do whatever they want to. And by, by the time they come back, You've done exactly what they've wanted to be done. That's professionalism. Like, why would a client hire you, then have to come behind you and tell you everything that you that to do? You don't want that. And honestly, it's a waste of the client's time. Why are you hiring me if you have to come back behind me and tell me exactly what to do? Focus on the main business problem we're solving. What do you need? I'll make sure you get what you need in a timely manner. So don't follow exactly what the client says. Of course, be respectful, be courteous. If a client really wants something, work with them. But it's your job as a professional to say what I'm offering you is exactly what you're looking for. And uh, you can give me your input, but my goal is to solve your problem. Because their input may not help solve a problem. I don't know. Another story. I uh, used to do a lot more graphic design and I would make flyers and other things. And people say, I have a change. Can you change this? Can you change this? Can you change that? There's nothing wrong with revisions. But if the client is telling me exactly what to do, then I'm liable to be blamed if it doesn't work. Clients rarely make changes and then they say, oh, I, I know I made the change, so that one's on me. You don't hear that. So if you are on the hook for solving a business problem, they can't change your solution and then hold you liable for that. You don't want that. You want to remain professional. You want to remain in control. You don't want to do exactly what the client says. You want to work with them to get what they want, but don't follow it exactly. Number five, you don't recognize when to say no. I made this mistake when I first started freelancing. I really wanted work. So I started doing like, I started saying yes to any client that came around because I was just happy that they would pay me. I would say yes, 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 yes. And I started getting clients. I'm like, oh, this is not the best fit for me. Uh, oh, no. You know, I thought I'd be able to get in the deadline. I'm, I'm you know, it's, I really need more time. It's, it's a bad rep reputation for the business you're trying to build. You need to recognize when you need to say no because no may be the best thing for you and your potential client. Saying no is a good thing. You only need to say yes to someone that you like working with. Um, they have enough money and can afford your services. Um, not only that, but you believe you can get it done in a timely manner. That's what you need to say yes to. Uh, a lot of these other things, if it's not perfect or it's not close to perfect, say no. I know somebody might be thinking, well, how am I going to get experience if I say no? And, uh, and I can say this from experience. Saying yes to everything just to get experience will leave you with um, clients that you can't even reference or use in your portfolio. And it ended up not being helpful in the future at all. So it's like you didn't work with them. So, yeah, going from there. Uh, we got five more. I'm going to get through really quick. Lightning fast. So six, you start work before having a contract. Um, an invoice is not a contract. I'll say it again. An invoice is not a contract. Never start any work without having a contract. Guys, there's tons of free resources online on how to write contracts. I've even written some. Um, there's even a lot of freelance contracts that exist. And all a contract is is an agreement between a client and the business professional and you're agreeing upon the work that you're doing. It's in place to protect you as a professional and your client as well. That's why you need to have a contract. So that's something that should be thought of as well. Um, everyone needs a contract. And don't start work until you have it. That's just, I see. I made a mistake. All these 10 things, I did. 
I've worked without a contract and I've been burned. Uh, sadly to say multiple times, you need a contract, period. And um, again, I have this here. I kind of have it here as a uh, mental reminder. This is not a, a contract, but I have this as a caveat. A contract is there to protect you. Um, you also need to protect the data you're working on and what you're doing. Uh, Backblaze is a service. No, they're not sponsoring this webinar, but Black Backblaze is a service to where you pay $50 for the year and they'll back up everything on your computer. That's amazing. I mean, that's less. It'll back it up to the cloud and you can download it whenever you need it. Um, that's cheaper than buying an external hard drive, like $50 for a year. That's great. So if you're working with someone and talking about contracts, I was talking about protection. So no matter what type of freelancer you are, you need to back up everything that you have in case something happens. So you, that's just a quick caveat I have. So never work without a contract, but also protect yourself with a contract and protect yourself by backing up stuff that you have. Uh, Cause you can have client agreements or emails or whatever. It needs to be backed up somewhere to where you can always get to it no matter what. Okay. Going from there. Number seven, um, you don't tell a story with your portfolio. I, and I'm going to switch cause I want to talk to you all. I used to make the mistake of operating with a portfolio like this. I get work, I book a client and then I just say, Hey, I worked with this client. I throw them on a portfolio. And the problem with that is similar to calling yourself a freelancer. You're leaving it up to the person's interpretation of what you did. Um, you want to take the time to tell a story with um, the particular portfolio you're building. You want to talk about the background. You want to talk about why they came to you. You want to talk about the problem you're solving. You want to move for the problem to... Um, any challenges that you face, and then you want to highlight the solution and then the results. And you have to tell that in a story format. People want to hear a story being told and they can remember a story, not facts. You know, not facts of worked with someone, built a WordPress, um, did HTML and CSS, did graphic design. That's terrible. I used to do this. I'm talking to my past self. I used to do this. A uh, question was just asked. Case studies are similar. Correct. Um, case studies go a little more in depth, but there's even a certain way you're supposed to write a case study. I see people doing that wrong. They say case study, and then it says, we worked with this company to provide this solution by doing this awesome custom-made solution that we came up with. Here's a quote from the company, the end. Mm, that wasn't the right way to write a case study. I see that a lot. Um, if you So in a sense, for your portfolio, it should be all case studies or, or you have a portfolio, but for each type of work you've done, there are case studies. So maybe you have a portfolio and there's 12 things in the portfolio, but three of those are in-depth case studies that are at the forefront of your portfolio, something like that. But this is the most slept on marketing tool people have at their ex disposal that they don't really use a portfolio that tells a story. Um, I talked about Helena. Uh, she's a little different. It's she's a photographer. She, because she's telling stories with her photos, she doesn't necessarily have to do that, but she still does it. She still writes out this, is, this was the goal. This is how I solved the goal. And here's the visuals that are a result. This is what happened after. She still does that too. So again, uh, definitely case studies. Um, it's a must. Uh, and there's a certain way you need to write case studies to do that. Um, number eight, you don't teach your clients. And I'm going to switch back uh, again. So number eight, you don't teach your clients. A problem is... Um, a lot of times we expect clients to just know everything. Uh, we expect clients to intuitively just kind of, you know, look at what we have to offer and just understand. And honestly, 
Um, that's not the case. You know, we need to make it as easy as possible, as simple as possible for the client. So teaching is an opportunity to transition someone who doesn't know exactly what you do or doesn't see your value to immediately see your value without buying anything, without paying for anything, right? They can immediately see your value. Drink of water really quick. They can immediately see your value. Um, and here's the thing. You can teach about anything, right? Um, there are certain things about your business you can teach about. And again, again, going back to what we said earlier, what are those common pains people have? What are those common questions people have? Teach on those topics, right? So for me as a web designer, and I'm actually going to rewrite a lot of things that I have on my website, but here's one thing I can teach on. What's the importance of having a website? Um, what is the main goal of the, having a website? What are the five more, most important pages on a website? How do you convince someone to buy on a website? How do you convince someone to trust you on a website? How do you set up a mailing list? How do you set up uh, the ultimate contact form so you can learn all the information you need to from your potential clients on a website? All I'm doing is um, speaking to the common problems I've heard people have in business and saying, this is how you execute it on a website. That's what I need to teach about. That's what I need to write about, right? And it, and don't think that you uh, don't know enough, right? Everyone's at different levels. Everyone's at different stages. So there's always beginners out there. There's always intermediate people, and there's always people who say they're advanced. They're always out there. So you definitely want to make sure to start teaching and just answer what those common questions are. Um who who was it in the chat that said uh i know that's social media who was it in the chat that said they're analysts oh jackie so jackie or amelia either either one of you uh, amelia mentioned social media um you can talk about what are the teach on what are the best times to post on social media teach about what are the the hottest social media um platforms out at the moment teach on the differences of how to connect with your audience on facebook on um, YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, there are differences. Some things work that don't work on others. What are those? I don't know. But if you teach me and uh, teach me something new, I trust you a little bit more. And I didn't even pay you yet. And now I feel like I owe you something. I at least, and I'll call you and say, hey, I learned a lot about this. What do you think about fill in the blank? And if uh, anybody's doing social media and they're not following Gary Vaynerchuk, definitely uh, follow him. He talks a lot about social media. All right, moving on from there because we're going to get to the questions. We're almost done. Uh, number nine, you don't ask your client the right questions. This goes back to solving a business problem. You have to go deeper. You have to go deeper. You can't say things such as, um, and again, I'm, who, I'm going to see who was in the chat that said that. Uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, Langa, if I'm pronouncing your name right. But you can't ask, what is your budget? Ask deeper questions um, to find out what they're looking for. Um, how many instruments you have? How many microphones do you want connected? That's going to tell you off the bat how many channels they want on the soundboard, right? Or how many they need. Um, how and you can help them by expanding even in the future. Um, things like that. You have to ask deeper questions than the surface to really get down to what it is that they want. And that only happens through conversation, getting to know uh, what someone really needs and just asking deeper questions. And I will, uh, I was contemplating whether or not I should tell you this, but I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you. I wrote a guide called uh, eight questions to uncover value and uh really um, i'll make that available i'll send that to everyone who's in the webinar matter of fact uh let's see for those who are in the chat i'm gonna put the link there and you can just go to the link and see some of those value questions so there you go 
Um, just look at that. And those are some of the right questions you need to ask and the logic behind why you're asking them. So yeah, there's a bonus right there. I didn't know I was going to do that. And the last thing is you allow scope creep. And scope creep is when you have agreed on something with a client and they always come back with one more thing and you just allow it because it's good customer service and you just allow it. Um, you definitely don't want that because it puts you in a position to where you're doing more work and not getting paid for it. There's ways to curb scope creep. Um, again, um, there's ways to say, maybe there's a certain set of revisions and when they're done with revisions, they're done, right? Um, again, if they keep bringing it up, let them know. Um, okay, I can do that for you. Now it is going to change the deadline because it's not what we agreed upon. Are you willing to move the deadline? No, I don't want to move the deadline. Okay, let's do that after launch or let's do that after we're done. Uh, but scope creep, really, you just have to take a stand. And I have a funny story that I'm going to tell. Some of you might have heard this, but it just illustrates the point well. Uh, people in the chat, answer what this is. This is a picture of a sandwich. What do you think this is? It has a, a bun on top. It has a bun in the middle. And it has a bun on the bottom. And it's from some place called McDonald's. But okay, good. Big Mac. It's a Big Mac, right? Um, <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, Latika, you probably know the person who did this. So I'm not going to say their name. I'm going to uh, say a different name. Uh, uh, so let's just call him uh, William. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a Big Mac. Everybody said Big Mac. I used to work at McDonald's, by the way. So that's that's, yeah. Not exactly. It's not a Big Mac. This is a double cheeseburger with a sesame seed bun, add lettuce, add Big Mac sauce, and put a bun in between with onions and pickles. Um, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a Big Mac. Uh, it's William Obina, not Wilson. It's William. Um, so with William in this case, uh, this is a funny story from college. Um, I went to the drive through with this guy named William and he didn't have much money. So he said he wanted a double cheeseburger. Now he was asking for a double cheeseburger because he didn't want to pay more money um, for a Big Mac. Right. So he said, yeah, let me get a dollar double cheeseburger on the sesame seed bun, add lettuce, add Big Mac sauce with onions and pickle and put a bun in between. Now McDonald's, they, <laughs> they rolled their eyes. They were upset, but they made it. And, um, we pull around to the drive through and we get to the in front of the window and I'm trying to like lean back to make sure, you know, they know it's not me because I'm like, this is not me. This is um, William who did it, not me. Um, and going from there, he asked them, Hey, do you mind if I, you know, I know, uh, thank you for making that by the way. Do you mind if I get a free fries and drink? And they gave it to him. So he got a, a Big Mac extra value bill for a dollar. Um, maybe William is the ultimate hustler or maybe he's a cheapskate. I don't know. I just know it was embarrassing and it made for a good story right now. But besides that point, that's <laughs> hey, Edward said, genius, brilliant. Um, <laughs> what's up, Edward? How you doing? But um, good to see you in here, man. But uh, yeah, so it's funny. Not everyone who's on this webinar is going to try to go get a Big Mac for a dollar. Uh, they'll probably do it. McDonald's doesn't like arguing with people. They'll probably do it. I, like I said, I used to work there. But anyway, <laughs> going on from there, that's what scope creep is like. Um, scope creep. And that's what I mentioned on the slide uh, previous to, where, to get to where we are now. Scope creep is the client continually asking for something asking for something, wanting something, but they're not willing to pay you more for it. And you're doing more work. You got to stop scope creep. That's a big mistake freelancers make. They tend to do things and say uh, the customer's always right, but they don't know that they're really, you know, missing out on an opportunity to be professional and steer somebody back down the path of 
remaining professional and remaining on task. So yeah, you don't want to do that uh, as a freelancer because it's a bad habit and people will take advantage of you. Um, I, I'm saying this again because this has happened to me and it's happened to me uh, before and frequently. So uh, it wasn't until I got burned by scope creep doing a lot of work and not getting paid for it that I realized this has to stop. So those are the 10 mistakes and these slides will be available you know, when, when we're done with this, it'll be available as well. But, you know, we're going to get towards the, we're getting closer to the end. But where do we go from here? Um, where do we go from here? You know, we talked about the background, student loan debt, getting a job you enjoy. Um, how do you transition to freelance? You know, first it needs to be something you enjoy doing or you have skills at, or maybe you need to learn a certain skill, right? Um, there's tons of places to learn online where you can do that. I'll hang out in the chat, ask me any questions. I can probably point you to a place to learn. Like no joke. I've, I have tons of things where that you can learn from, you know, going from there, but where do we go from here? You know, how do you get to the point of transitioning to become a freelancer? We talked about a lot of these things today. And again, going back to uh, a previous slide, and I'll bring up these thumbnails because I want to, going back all the way to a previous slide that I had earlier, my podcast, I talk about all these things on the podcast. So we can go in depth on any of these things, but really the real point I want to mention to you is how do we go from here? What can we do? Um, where do we start? Where do we begin? And the key is this. The key is you have a creative skill and maybe you have business knowledge. Maybe. Um, more than likely, if you're working a day job, you have some le level of business knowledge. Don't sell yourself short. But and if you don't have that creative skill, it can be learned, right? I, I went to school for engineering and now I know web design. I just learned. It wasn't it took time, but it wasn't that long, honestly. So here's my question. You know, uh, my question is, how, how do you determine your unique value? Like, you're, you're, you know, there's always two types of people. You're either creative and you want to be respected, or you have business knowledge, but you're not really creative. The key, honestly, going from here is you need to bring those two things together. Your unique value is going to be the creative knowledge you have coupled with business knowledge. And for me, I ended up going to grad school to try to learn this thing. And I really wish I learned it earlier. But even in grad school, they didn't teach me all these business things. They were teaching me to work for another person. They were teaching me to work for another company. And that's not really going to help me be unique individually. So what can I do? So I'm going to hang out and we're going to do Q and a, but just going from there, honestly and truly, I wanted to see, and I wanted to know how can I truly help people learn all these things in a quick way. Right. And that is freelance jumpstart. So what I did, I started this three years ago. I started putting how can someone quickly transition and get into freelance really quick without going through all the problems and all the mistakes that I had to learn? How can they quickly learn? So I compiled everything and turned it into a resource for freelancers. And that is called Freelance Jumpstart, right? Um, that's what I put together. And Freelance Jumpstart is made up of a couple of different things. There's lessons and then there's video interviews. So Helena Price that I mentioned earlier, she, she her interview is a part of the resource Freelance Jumpstart. So that's available. Uh, the lesson breakdown, I talk about the four freelance questions. We kind of walk through those today. Solving a business problem, choosing your business name, right? So I'm trying to go as deep as I can in the things that people don't think about. You know, so... You need a business, but how do you choose a name? Do you want to just randomly choose a name? No, there's a way to do that. How do you set your business up? 
is it an LLC? Is it a sole proprietorship? Is it a partnership? Is it a corporation? What's the difference? That is laid out in a lesson. How do you find what your true value is? I talked about choosing a better name for yourself and not calling yourself a freelancer. I walk you through how to come up with your own name. And that and many other lessons are here. And I plan to add tons of other ones in the future. This is just the starting point of the resource. Going from there, I mentioned the interviews. I found the top freelancers in the industry and I said, hey, I wanna interview you. This is for people trying to learn to become freelancers. Do you mind interviewing? They all said yes. And we had an interview. And they went into depth and said some things that I've never heard them say on their website or their blog. That's what really, you know, helped me. I said, wow, I've never heard you say that. And I follow you online. You've never said that before. They talked about all those things. So in this resource, there's tons of things. And, you know, this is just a preview of some of the things. There's a guidebook. So I wrote about a hundred, over a hundred pages of, because some people like to read more. Um, but I walk through in that book and I explain how you can become a freelancer in a step-by-step -step process. And I even take the time to say, this is what I did. This is why I made a decision. This is what I stopped at. This is what I didn't do. This is what I wish I did. Um, I already mentioned the interviews and the lessons. Uh, there's even templates. I mentioned how, one mistake was freelancers tend to not know how to write a contract. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to write one for you. Here it is. You can lose it. You can use it. It's a starting point. There's a community. We're sitting here in the chat. Uh, Latika may know something that Edward doesn't know, that Jackie doesn't know, that Obina doesn't know. Um, I created a community where people can join in and we can talk like this on an everyday basis and learn from one another. Um, it's 24-7 and it works on any device. So I've been putting a lot of work to create this resource because I wanted to be able to answer all these questions and more in a quick way, but still have it available to whoever wants it. And then, and for those, and the cool thing is Sean is in the course. So you don't have to take it from me. I don't want to talk. Uh, Sean is taking the course right now. Let, he can tell you, ask him what you want to ask him if it's, if it's helping him down the path of defining his unique skills as a freelancer, you know, he'll let you know. Uh, and no, Sean was not paid. Uh, you know, Sean, Sean has, uh, been very good and helped me make it better. He said he was, <laughs> what were you paid? I know he's joking, but, um, going from there that this resource will help you Take an idea you have and build it from scratch. You can charge what you're worth. I get into pricing. There's a lot of free stuff I talk about on my website about pricing, but in this one, there's a calculator. I say, what do you want to make in a year? How many billable hours do you have? And it says, this is what you need to charge per hour. So for those wondering, what do I charge? It's like, tell me what your goals are and this is what you need to charge. And it is a fair price. And you can even use that. And I even tell you, this is how I calculated it. You can even show that to a client and say, this is my rate, $100 an hour. That's a lot. Ooh, that's a lot of money. That was a reference to Living Color. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers that. Good Lord, that's a lot of money. That was a reference. Anyway, um, somebody may say, that's a lot of money, $100 an hour. I'm not paid $100 an hour. But you say, this is how I calculated it. Once they see it, they'll go, oh, never mind. You can't, you can't really fight that. And it took me a while to get to that point as well. Um, I worked with a client rec recently. I charged them a lower rate in the past, but this time I charged them a new rate. And I said, this is it. And he was like, oh, well, um, I said, this is how I came to that number. He's like, never mind. Because I was able to communicate the value and he saw – the value of what he was getting way outweighed what I was charging. And he was like, never mind. So now I literally times six what I used to charge and he didn't flinch. Hey, uh, that's not really me. That's just understanding what my value is and communicating it in the proper way. So again, if you want to go to freelance jumpstart, um, you can go there, you can join now. This resource is available. And you can definitely be a part of that resource. So again, I just wanted to make mention of this. I don't like 
I guess you could say selling. I don't want to try to sell anybody, but um, because I could not find an online course and I've taken many online courses, but because I could not find, and I just pasted the link in the chat because I could not find an online course that answered every question that I had, I decided to make it and I decided to create it. And that's what freelance jumpstart is. Again, um, thank you all for hanging out. Thank you all. And we're not over because we're going to do a Q&A, but um, that's the teaching content that I had for today. I'm going to do another one of these webinars, so it'll be on a different topic. But again, that's what we have for today. Since you hung around, I mentioned there was a free um, course at the end. These are free lessons from the course, right? So from the resource Freelance Jumpstart, these are free ones, three of them. And, you know, you can definitely go to this link, uh, respectandvalue.com, and I will also uh, paste that in the chat as well. You can go to respectandvalue.com and get those free lessons and start to see some of the quality and some of the things that I'm talking about. And maybe you do want to join the resource so you can be a part of the community, so you can have someone to talk to and bounce ideas off of and get your, your unique questions answered, not a cookie-colored solution that exists. So yeah, going from there, um, that leads us to Q&A. You guys have been great. You hung around. I'm going to answer these questions. You can stay or you can, um, you know, if you need to leave, that's okay as well. Like I said, the replay is available. And I'm going to answer this question. Uh, the first question is, you know, if you want to establish your expertise in a chosen field, how important is blogging? Um, a lot of people take blogging and they try to look at it, but yeah, thanks, Edward. A lot of people take blogging and they try to look at it like, I want to become a blogger. I have to write every week. I have to write new content. No, you don't. If you take the time to continually find those burning questions that people have and, you know, you say, <laughs> she's a great search. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, you know, if you take the time to find those burning questions that people have and only write about those, you don't have to write every week. You don't have to write 50,000 things and try to keep up with the Joneses on all this blogging content. But blogging is important because when people are trying to make a decision on whether or not to use your services and you teach them something of value, it's the law of reciprocity. You've given them something. So now they feel like, I feel like I should do something. Maybe I should at least call them. I owe them that, right? So that's something that you can do as well. You can blog about those important questions. Um, I try to blog on a weekly basis, uh, but that pace can be very daunting for business. All you really need are key articles around a central topic and just start talking about that one thing. And they, and they all can be related to the service that you offer. So was that a decent answer for uh, blogging? I don't mind uh, going a little deeper if I have to, but I wanted to make mention of that. Um, again, uh, I mentioned social media earlier. Um, back on this, what is a social media plan worth for a small business? I talked about how to reverse calculate what your value is. That's what I talked about. But again, social media has value. Some people do want, well, here's the thing since Facebook changed, I don't use Facebook since it's popular. You can run a social media campaign to raise awareness and get likes on a page. The more likes you get on the page, the higher the organic reach on a page. Also, the more likes you get on the page, the better you can start taking targeted ads to people who already like your brand. So an example would be on Facebook, you could upload a, a video. And whoever watches that watches that video can be put in a new audience. And you can say, I want to show this particular ad to people who finished the video. You can start doing things like that. Now, you can start communicating to your clients that I'm able to do marketing that's so targeted. Other people can't do that. When, when commercials run on TV, they don't know who's watching. They have an idea of who's watching the network. They have an idea of 
um, demographic information maybe of the region is being broadcasted in, but they can't, they don't know who's watching what, right? They just have an idea. With social media, you can really get deep on building an audience that likes your brand. And then for the business, it's cheaper for them to market. Maybe your social media plan is literally getting the brand more exposure. Whether they use you or not in the future, it is now cheaper for them to market in the future than it was when without your help. So you can even do a compare and contrast to this is what it costs to market to people who are familiar with your brand on social media. This is what it costs to market to people who are not familiar with your brand. I want to run a campaign to get people familiar with your brand and save you this amount. When people see that, they have they have no choice but to say that's value. Why wouldn't they take that? Right? And then again, uh, the final question, I believe, uh, I believe uh, this is the final question I see listed here. I believe uh, Sean asked it, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, let's see. Yeah. So I believe that's the final question. Uh, and going back, um, as humbly as I could say, uh, just, just being extremely humble, the most humble I could possibly be. Um, again, uh, a great website that I mentioned earlier uh, is my website, uh, NathanAlote.com. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this humbly, but NathanAlote.com is a good website and a good resource to go to. I'm so excited for season two of my podcast. It is coming. Uh, guys, major stuff is coming up. Like, seriously. Um I have a whole new section of my podcast that's going to be Q and A. So I'm going to, it's an opportunity for, to get your specific questions answered again, like we answered today. But so that resource is available. Uh, I mentioned during the talk, freelancersunion.org. Um, they do a great job of just talking about uh, freelancers and what they have to offer. And the fact that they do a good job of talking about uh, like insurance for freelancers, like, you know, insurance and health benefits. That's a question. Um, another one is Milo, Milo.co. And I'll, I'll paste all these in the chat. You know, why not? Right. Um, another one is Milo.co. Um, that's another good resource for freelancers where they just talk about uh, different things for freelancing. It's funny. I'm mentioning all these things and see, because I, I'm mentioning all these other resources because Honestly, it's important that you get the help you're looking for, uh, not necessarily uh, what I'm trying to get or what what's, what I could benefit from. I really want you to get the, the help that you really need and deserve. So another one, as I just mentioned, uh, double your freelance rate. And double your freelance rate, um, even before that, there's a bigger site called Double Your Freelancing. That's by Brennan Dunn. I interviewed him and he is a part of the resource uh, Freelance Jumpstart. The resource that I made, I interviewed him and he's there. He's a part of that resource as well. And I tried to get like-minded freelancers to talk about these things. Brennan is right here. Uh, Brennan is right here. That's Brennan Dunn who has double your, double your freelancing. And I'll paste that here. Um, that's another resource for freelancers. He talks more from the consultant side of things. So he's more of a consultant. He he's he's a develop he was a developer. That's more of a consultant. So he talks more of that. I talk more about you're a freelancer. This is how you need to run your business. Let me answer a specific question freelancers have. Um, so that's another thing that I do as well. I tend to speak like that. So those are a couple of resources, books. Uh, tons of books. There are tons of books that exist. Um, right now I'm reading Confessions of uh, a Pricing Specialist. I'm reading another one called The Psychology of Pricing. There's another book I'm reading called Getting to Yes, um, The Five Second Rule, The 10X Rule by Grant Cardone. I'm reading a book by Seth Godin called The Dip. Uh, I have tons of books, probably too many. But I have all that again. So that's just a few things that I would make reference to um, my podcast and those other links that I posted in the chat. They're all good things to do. 
well, I'll just say this much. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to stick around. Uh, I apologize again. We had some glitches in the beginning, but I was able to work them out and we were able to talk about this. This webinar was, uh, you know, it was quite long, I would say, but that's because I wanted to answer every question and go into depth on everything that we talked about. I am going to do this in the future. And when I do this, I'll make it a little more streamlined and talk about these things. Yeah, I had a blast hanging with you all. Uh, it's been great. I'll hang around in the chat and answer any questions that you all have. But